Hello everyone, welcome. So it's been a little bit. I took a short break from filming videos just because I had a lot of things going on and I needed some time, but I'm very excited to be back. I have some really exciting things I get to share with you really soon. Very much looking forward to that. And I also um, am excited to talk to you about all of the books that I've read recently because that's what we're gonna do today. I haven't really given you an update since the start of the year of everything I've read so far this year. And I have read 38, I'm about to finish my 39th book of the year. And and it's only March, which is really good for me. I don't think I've been reading at this pace for a while, but lately, like, all I've wanted to do is read. I've just been reading voraciously, which has been fantastic, but that also means that we have a lot of books to get through. Uh, so yeah, without any further ado, let's talk about all the books I've read so far this year, the good, the bad, and the ones you absolutely have to read. <laughs> okay, so the first book I read this year was The Housekeeper and the Professor by Yoko Ogawa. This is a book that I got last year because I think I saw it recommended on TikTok and it looked really interesting to me and, like, something I would enjoy. Joy. It's a very short book uh, translated from Japanese and it is, as the title suggests, about this math professor and his housekeeper. And the professor has some memory issues, so every single day he forgets the previous day. And the story is about the housekeeper as she tries to help the professor with his day-to-day -day needs and also her young son and their relationship to the professor. So based on the description, I expected this to be an emotional kind of story about their interpersonal relationships and their connections to each other, obviously about memory in some ways and how we hold on to memories and things like that. And while it was in some ways about those things, to be honest with you, so much of this book was about baseball that I was shocked. <laughs> that's just not what I was expecting. There's just like a storyline that's about baseball cards because I honestly can't remember. I read this like a couple months ago and it left my brain, but either the professor or the son of the housekeeper was super into baseball cards. And so they're trying to collect some baseball cards to help him remember something. Can't remember the exact details, but it just, a lot of it ended up being about baseball. And I know that so much of that was obviously metaphor, but like it was just, I'm, I'm not a sports person and baseball is definitely one of the sports I would pay least attention to. So like I was just taken aback by how much of this book was about baseball. I thought more of it would be about math. There were like a couple things in there about math for sure that stuck out, but it really wasn't about math. I would have taken the math over the baseball. That's what I was anticipating. <laughs> I don't know how to explain it. it. This just really didn't stand out to me very much. I ended up giving it a three out of five stars. I think it's probably like a 2.75. I don't think it's a bad book. I do think some people would really enjoy it. It just wasn't for me personally. And again, too much baseball in a book about math. <laughs> the next book that I read was Idol Burning by Rin Usami. This was another very short book. I read it really quickly and it follows the story of this girl who is a fan of a Japanese pop idol group, specifically one idol in that group. The idol has recently come under fire for some accusations that were made against him. The story is really about fan culture and how we idolize celebrities, how we place them on these pedestals and what that does to us as well and what we're willing to excuse, what we are willing to look over, things like that. Uh, so it's just kind of giving commentary on those things. I was a little hesitant before I went into the book because I didn't really know what direction we were going to go in, but I actually ended up really enjoying this. I gave it about four out of five stars. It's probably more like 3.75, but I did like it while I was reading it and I liked the ultimate message of the story. It was pretty difficult to read at times. I would definitely make sure to look up content warnings before you decide to read this. Again, like I said, it is very short, so you can read it very quickly, um, but I thought that it made a very poignant commentary on what that fan culture can be like what the mindset of somebody who is that entrenched into fandom culture specifically when it comes to um, idol culture. As someone who is a big k-pop fan and kind of doesn't get really involved in like the k-pop fandom very much but has observed it from a distance at least, there were definitely aspects of the story that I could personally relate to and things that I felt were very accurately represented in some ways. But yeah, I think anyone who is super into fandom in general would probably enjoy reading this. I think you'd be able to see aspects of either yourself or people you know or you know the community that you're a part of in parts of this story as well. But yeah, I definitely enjoyed this and I think it was worth reading. So if that interests you at all, I would recommend picking it up. But again, just be sure to look up content warnings. Okay, the next two books I read are uh, the first two books in a trilogy. I believe the third book I think is supposed to come out this year or next year. But this is a series I've been wanting to start for a while, and that is the Once Upon a Broken Heart series by Stephanie Garber. Is that what the series is called? I actually don't know what the series itself is called. <laughs> but we have the first book, Once Upon a Broken Heart, and the second book, The Ballad of Never After. These are the UK covers. I bought these over the US covers because I think they are so much nicer. <laughs> and this one's not a first edition, so it doesn't have anything under the cover, but this one is, and it has this super pretty dragon 
like gold foiled onto the front cover. It looks so nice. I love it. <laughs> this series is very fairy tale inspired. In the first book, we follow around our main character, Evangeline Fox, who finds out that the person she's in love with is marrying somebody else. So she makes a deal with someone called the Prince of Hearts to prevent him from going through with his marriage to someone else. And then that ends up backfiring on her because she realizes you can't make deals with fates because they will just trick you. And then we're just thrust into this fairy tale world with kings and queens and princes and princesses and fates and immortal beings and it's just a lot of fun. I really read these because I wanted some kind of like escapist fantasy romance that was lighthearted and wasn't going to take me too much time to read or require too much brain power and these were perfect for that. I had a great time. I'm not gonna lie to you, I read them really fast. I barely remember what happens. I, I honestly can't tell you much of the actual plot. I just remember the vibes, and honestly that's all I really needed while I was reading these, so that's fine. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I gave each of them four stars. Overall, so far, the series is four stars to me. I am very excited for the last book to come out. This one leaves off on like a pretty big cliffhanger, so I feel like the next one is going to be an exciting time and I can't wait. But yeah, again, really just needed a good, fun fantasy time and these books delivered, so that's what you're also looking for definitely would recommend these. Okay, so next up, um, I read probably what will end up being the biggest release of this year. I think it probably will be the biggest release of the year across the board, and that is Spare by Prince Harry. Yes, I read this whole thing. I actually listened to the audiobook. I have pretty complicated feelings about this book because unlike some people, I didn't hate it at all, actually. I didn't love it, I enjoyed certain aspects of it and honestly there were things about it that surprised me, like he was more critical of certain things than I expected him to be. And then in other ways was far less critical than I think he needed to be. <laughs> there are parts of this book that are so unbelievably tedious and long, like all of the chapters on him being in the military. I understand why he included it because it was obviously a very significant and long portion of his life that very much shaped him, but it was too much in the book and it was described in too much detail, like it, we just didn't need that information it kind of wasted time, I think. But in the other parts of the book, when he was talking about his childhood and when he was talking about his time after he left the military, I enjoyed those far more. I felt like it was extremely honest. It felt very genuine. Don't know who his ghostwriter is or if he has one, but they are a very good writer, so credit to them. <laughs> and the reason that I feel kind of conflicted is because I remember when this first came out, there were all the memes, all the TikTok sounds that people were making from this, which obviously, yeah, some of them were very funny. To me, it felt like a lot of the criticisms of this book, not the criticisms of people saying that there was too much military propaganda in here. I wholeheartedly agree with that. And I'm not talking about the royalists who are critiquing this because they're saying he's too harsh on the royal family. Honestly, he could have been so much harsher. I wish he was harsher. I don't care about them either. But I'm talking about the people who were being critical of the book in the sense that they were saying that he was just like sharing too much information and it was uncomfortable and making fun of like that one section where he's talking about his mother and Elizabeth Arden cream. If you've read it, you know what I'm talking about or if you've heard the TikTok sound. The problem is if you've heard the TikTok sound, it's like out of context and so you don't get like the full understanding of what that really meant. I think like when people are making those specific critiques or criticisms, to me that comes from a place of misogyny because he was being very, very vulnerable. He was being extremely emotional in a way that I don't think we see a lot of very powerful white men express vulnerability. And that's what I actually really appreciated about this book. I felt like it was extremely vulnerable. It was extremely honest. Whether or not he was telling the truth doesn't really matter. It felt extremely honest and that's rare to experience from um, somebody with his position of power and his status in society. I felt like throughout portions of this book he was definitely critiquing aspects of masculinity and talking about how limiting that can be and how he had to repress so many of his emotions for so long. And I felt like people were kind of missing the point of that by critiquing the way that he chose to be vulnerable about these very, very intimate, very personal details of his life. This is not me trying to like come to Prince Harry's defense. Like, I don't think he needs me defending him. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying that I think that a man with his position and power and status choosing to be that vulnerable with this many people on like a platform this big was actually kind of powerful. And I think that was the most 
powerful thing about the entire book. I really think that he confronted the barriers and boundaries of masculinity in a way that you don't really see people like him do very often. And I think that that can have a really profound impact on people. And I don't know if that's what he intended for people to take away from this, but that is personally what I took away from it and why I do think that this book definitely has some merit. Yeah, those are my thoughts on Spare. I really don't know what I would rate this. Like, I can't give it a rating. I honestly think if you care at all about what's going on with their whole dynamic and like the whole royal family, just watch the Meghan and Harry documentary. I liked that a lot. I actually really enjoyed it. Would I recommend you to read it? No, not really, unless you're into anything about the royals. Honestly, if you wanted to read this, you can just skip all the chapters about him in the military. Like, it's really not worth it. <laughs> you decide for yourself. But those are my thoughts on Spare. Okay, the next book I read was A River Enchanted by Rebecca Ross. This is the first book in a fantasy duology. I still haven't read the second book. I definitely plan to read that one very soon because I really enjoyed this. Do I remember a lot of details about this book? Absolutely not, because I read this when I just wanted fantasy vibes and I was just in that mood like soon after I'd read Ballad of Never After. I wanted more fantasy vibes, so I picked this up. So I can't tell you a lot of specific plot details. I just know that it takes place in the Isle of Cain we follow around our main characters. They were childhood enemies. Jack is a bard and he hasn't been to the Isle of Cadence in like 10 years. In their hometown, these girls are just going missing and nobody knows who is doing it, so they need his help because they think that the spirits are either the ones stealing the girls or they know something about who has been stealing these girls and they need his help with his music to draw out the spirits so that they can ask them questions. So they have to work together and that's basically like the general plot. But the best way I can describe this book is if any of you remember the show Rain, that like old royal show with um, Adelaide Kane as the main character as Mary Queen of Scots, it was like a fake version of the story of Mary Queen of Scots and like what happened to her. It took a lot of liberties, but it was running on CW for like years and it was horrible. Okay, that show was so bad, but I was obsessed with it, okay? And I used to watch it religiously. I stopped watching after season three, if you know, you know, but I would watch like compilation videos of the like scenes that the two main love interests had with each other on YouTube all the time because I was obsessed with them. I was obsessed with their romance. Honestly, low-key still am. I know it's so historically inaccurate, didn't care. It was still fun. <laughs> but this book, I feel like, gives me the vibes of that story in some ways, like the better parts of Rain, combined with the better parts of Outlander. I've also seen Outlander. I've only seen the first two and a half seasons, I think, and I got bored and I stopped watching. And I personally don't like Outlander, like at all, especially season one. Like I, I have so many issues with that show. Yes, I still did watch the entire thing. But if you take the better, more fun parts of Outlander and the less like graphic, disturbing parts of it, and the better parts of Rain and combine them, you kind of get this. That's what this made me feel and I really really enjoyed my time reading it. So if you're looking for a fun fantasy duology, again I haven't read the second book yet so I can't technically vouch for that one, but I think I'm probably gonna enjoy it just as much as I enjoyed this one. I would definitely recommend trying these out. I picked this up honestly because I thought the cover was so pretty and I really enjoyed the book as well. And so I'm very excited to get to the second book and I hope I enjoy it as much as this one. And I think I gave this about four out of five stars as well. The next book I read was Midnight in Everwood. This is kind of a reimagining, retelling, inspired by the story of the Nutcracker. It's been a long time since I've seen the Nutcracker Ballet, so I don't remember a lot of the specific details, but this kind of follows the general like main beat points of the Nutcracker storyline. So if you like the Nutcracker at all, I think you'll probably enjoy this. It's a really fun wintry read and I had a good time reading it. I read it also mostly because people were comparing it to the Night Circus. I would not say it's really similar to the Night Circus at all, but I think part of the comparison comes from the fact that there are lots of passages that describe like the food and it's really vivid, the imagery is really vivid. I get where the comparisons come from but personally like if you're looking to read something similar to that I wouldn't recommend this for that purpose but it's still a great book. I still had a good time with it. Again just another really fun fantasy story, not super super high stakes so it wasn't like really overwhelming to read. I think it's the perfect book to read during the winter time. 
just like watching the Nutcracker is perfect to do during the winter time. And I ended up giving this about four out of five stars as well. It's probably closer to like 3.75. Okay, the next book on my list is a book you all know that I've read because it was the topic of my last video, and that is none other than Chain of Thorns by Cassandra Clare, the final book in the Last Hours series. I'm not going to talk about this a lot because I talked about it for over an hour in my last video, so you can go watch that if you've read it and you want to know more. But in summary, if you have watched the video, you already know this. I was extremely disappointed and I'm, I'm still a little hurt, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> it's very hard to have the finale of one of your all-time favorite series just not live up to what you expected it to be, to just not not hit the way it should have hit. It's far from like one of the worst endings to a book series I've read, but personally I think it was just the most disappointing for me because I expected so much more. I ended up giving this three out of five stars. I can't dwell on it too much. I don't want people to think that I hated it. I definitely didn't. I just wish some things had been different, but alas. I can't change anything. <laughs> the next book that I read is The Beautiful Ones by Silvia Moreno-Garcia. This is a book I bought last year that I was really excited to read because one, I just thought the cover was really pretty, and two, I'd heard fantastic things about it, and I ended up really liking this. Timeline-wise, I want to say this takes place late 1800s, early 1900s, somewhere around there probably. We follow around our main character Nina, who has just had her debut into society, and she meets Hector, our other main character, and she quickly is infatuated with him. He is kind of newer in town so she doesn't really know him. He's a bit older than her but she finds him completely mesmerizing because Hector is telekinetic just like Nina is. She also has powers because there is a magic system in this but it's very very light. I would not describe this book as fantasy. It's magical realism in some ways but even then the magic is not like a very significant part of the story. It's just kind of there. And then our third main character is Valerie and Valerie was Hector's first love. The two of them were in love years ago. I think 10 years ago or so and Hector has just come back to town, so there's like this little love triangle kind of going on. But there's a lot more to it than that. The characters were extremely morally gray, and so many of the characters walked the line between being good and bad and making the right choice or the wrong choice. There was just so much nuance in them, and no one in this book was perfect in any way. And I really enjoyed that about it because it made reading the story and made the characters so much more fleshed out and also harder to root for in some ways. But I liked that because it made them so complex. You will definitely read this and there will be characters that you will hate, but you can also understand them and that's what I liked. That's why the characters felt realistic to me. Even if I disagreed with what they were doing and I would never make those choices myself, it didn't matter because I could understand them and the book, no matter what, kind of made you feel some empathy for them. And I just loved the way the author wrote these morally complex and morally gray characters. So yeah, I'm very excited to read more by Sylvia Moreno-Garcia. I feel like I will like their other work a lot too, but this was a really enjoyable read. So if you're looking for a very quick historical romance, I definitely recommend trying this out. It's not an absolute favorite I've ever read. Another book I gave four stars. Just look up content warnings too if you decide to read this. It wasn't super heavy or anything, but I can remember like a couple scenes here and there that might be a bit graphic or difficult for people to read. So yeah, again, would recommend it if it sounds interesting to you. Okay, next up I read another romance book, which I have touched on briefly in one video so far this year, I think, um, but that is Beach Read by Emily Henry. I mentioned this in my tier ranking romance video, but this is my favorite Emily Henry book easily. I think it is her best one. Book Lovers is definitely my second. I did enjoy that one a lot too, but something about this really just touched me and spoke to me in a lot of ways, and I really enjoyed it much more than I thought I would. This book follows the story of these two authors who were kind of college rivals, and they end up reconnecting once they move in next door to each other. So it's a little cheesy in some ways, but like isn't all romance a little cheesy in some ways? And all Emily Henry books are cheesy, but I think this was a very good cheesy. I had a great time reading it. Um, there were some quotes and stuff that I marked up in here that I really enjoyed too. I think if you're gonna read an Emily Henry book, this is personally the one I would recommend most. I think it is the most emotional and it has the most well-rounded and well-written characters in it. It felt like her whole heart and soul was put into this book and that really came across on the page. So yeah, this would definitely be my Emily Henry recommendation if you're interested in reading her books. They're very different from other romance books. These are not spicy rom-coms exactly. They're a little bit more on the side of like lit fic or the genre that everyone calls women's fiction, but I hate that term. I think it's 
unproductive and kind of meaningless. But yeah, it's a bit more like lit fig, I would say, than just like your traditional romance romance. But still, had a great time with this one, and I'm glad to have finally read all of her books now, and I'm excited for Happy Place to come out. All right, the next book that I read is a book I saw a couple of times on TikTok or Instagram, I can't remember, and I just really liked the cover. I decided to pick it up on a whim and I'm so glad I did. This was the first book I gave five stars this year and that is As Long As The Lemon Trees Grow. This book was devastating. <laughs> if you want something to make you cry, this will make you cry. I didn't sob while reading it, but that's not the book's fault. That's only because I wasn't in a place emotionally to like, you know, actually cry physically. And even then, even though I like couldn't cry for like any reason, I still teared up while reading this book. So I know if I'd been like normal <laughs> when I read this, I would have been sobbing on the floor. It was really sad, like really, really sad and really hard to read because this book is about the Syrian revolution. We follow around our main character, Salama, who is a pharmacist, actually just a pharmacy student who had to leave school early in order to help the victims of the attacks that are going on. And she's basically working at a hospital now as a pseudo doctor um, to help anyone in need, all while trying to help her pregnant sister-in-law and herself escape. So based on that description alone, you know it's gonna be sad. It's really sad. <laughs> Devastating. There is an event that takes place in this book, a plot twist if you will, that I, I could not see coming, okay? At this point in my reading career, in my TV, movie, watching career, with all the media I consume, I can predict most things that will happen in TV shows, books, and stuff that I watch and read because I've seen so many things and like nothing is that unpredictable to me anymore. Didn't see it coming. Didn't, didn't see it coming. I couldn't. Was I just not paying attention because I was so overwhelmed with my emotions? Perhaps. But I also think it was just genius and it was so well done, so well written, absolutely heart-wrenching. There were also so many references to like Studio Ghibli movies as well and as a Studio Ghibli girly myself who loves them, I loved all of those too. The romance, so beautiful. Tear me to pieces, oh my god, it was so good. It was just fantastic, absolutely fantastic. More people should read this book and talk about it because, oh my god, <laughs> I, I loved it. Five out of five stars, please read it. Look up content warnings because it's rough but please read it if you can. Okay, next up we move into what so far is my favorite book I have read in 2023. And honestly, not a book I expected to be my favorite of the year so far. Something to definitely top it, but I was shocked by how much I liked this. Like I really, I really didn't think I was gonna like it that much. And I did. And that is The Last Tale of the Flower Bride by Roshni Chokshi. So I have read three books by Roshni Chokshi previously. I read um, her first series that I'm blanking on the name of now. And then I read The Gilded Wolves around the time that it came out, but I didn't really like the book very much. Honestly, I feel like I'd have to reread it because I, I don't remember a thing from it. But to me at that time, I didn't find it very engaging. But this book, this was fantastic. <laughs> I will preface this by saying, I don't think everyone will love this as much as I did. I understand why some people might not like it very much at all, but personally, there was just something about this that just really, really touched me, that really resonated with me. There were aspects of the story that I could relate to on such a fundamental level that things that it voiced that I didn't think other people also thought about in like the same way or things that I didn't think other people did. And I think that that's the main reason why I loved this so, so much. I think there are other more objective things about the story that were very well done that um, I think deserve a lot of credit as well. But personally, there was just stuff in this book that was just so specific and niche to things that I just, it felt like someone was in my head. It felt like someone was in my head years and years ago and they were unearthing things that I hadn't even thought about for so long. <laughs> and I loved it. I love when a book does that. It's hard to explain what this book is about. It reminds me a little bit of Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier. And that's because the book is told in two perspectives. The first perspective is that of the bridegroom. That's what we refer to him as at the very beginning. And he ends up meeting Indigo, who is kind of like the main force of this story, the Rebecca of the story, if you will. And she is this like alluring, almost siren-like woman who just completely mesmerizes him. He falls head over heels in love with her and they end up getting married. And then the other chapters are told from the perspective of Indigo's 
childhood best friend. And so we go back and forth between Indigo now from the perspective of her husband and Indigo when they were young from the perspective of her childhood best friend. And the story is about that specific type of female friendship you have when you're young that's extremely codependent, that toes the line of platonic and romantic and you can't really tell the difference between those two things, and the complicated emotions that come up with all of that. It's about emotional manipulation, lots of gaslighting. It's a little gothic, it's a little dark, it's really mysterious, and I loved it. Like I just, I don't know how to explain how much I love this book. It was not what I expected it to be at all, but it was so much better than anything I could have expected. Five out of five, highly recommend. If any of that intrigued you, don't look into it anymore. You don't need to know anything else, just read it. Look up content warnings, it can get dark and disturbing at times, but oh my god, so glad I read this. So glad I didn't listen to some reviews where people were saying it wasn't good because for me, this was perfect. So yeah, if you end up not liking it, you can't blame me for it. I think this is going to be a very divisive book for a lot of people, but for me, it worked perfectly. Okay, the next book I read this year is a book I've been meaning to read for a couple years now, and that is Almond. This is a novel translated from Korean. I literally picked this up because I saw Namjoon talk about it from BTS years ago, and I was like, okay, if he liked it, I have to read it now. Even though he's read some books that I did not like, um, but still wanted to give it a try. I'm really glad I did because I loved this. This book follows the story of this boy who basically cannot feel emotions. He doesn't feel angry, he doesn't feel sadness, even when really objectively sad or upsetting things happen in his life. He doesn't experience emotions the way everyone else tends to experience emotions. And because of that he's always been a bit of an outcast and it takes place over mostly the span of like a year or so of his life where these major events happen and how he works through them. It's a really introspective novel, a lot about emotions and feeling and how we interpret the world around us, and I loved it. This is the type of literary fiction I really like personally, so if you've read this and you have other recommendations that are kind of similar to this, please let me know because I'd be very interested in reading any other work that's somewhat like this one. But yeah, highly recommend. I'm so glad I finally picked this up. I ended up giving it about 4.25 out of 5 stars. Okay, so the next several books, I don't even know how many it is. I lost count. I literally stopped counting, um, but it accounts for a good portion of the 38 books I've read so far this year. The next several volumes of Yona of the Dawn. One day I sat down and I binged like 15 of these in a row. Couldn't stop me. Nothing stopped. I non-stop only took a bathroom break and to eat one time. I just couldn't stop reading them. They're so good. <laughs> I read the first 10 volumes last year after I watched the anime and I fell in love with the anime, I fell in love with the manga. I bought like almost all of them. I was just in the mood the other day. I don't know what it was. And I just sat down and I read them all. And I still have more left. I'm on volume 34 right now, I think. So I still have a few left to catch up with the most recent publication. I can't say anything obviously because I I don't want to spoil the story, but oh my god does it get good. It gets so good. Now I'm even more upset that we don't have more of the anime because it deserves an adaptation. This is truly such a great story. It's criminal. It's criminal that there's not a full adaptation. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, if you've needed another sign to pick up Yona of the Dawn, please do if you like historical fantasy, great slow, slow, slow burn romance. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> it's so good. It's everything I've been wanting and certain volumes, this one in particular, volume 30, really kill me. And I just, I need more people to read these because I need, I, you all need it in your lives. You need it in your life, okay? Like this is just so healing in so many ways and it's reignited that like passion for reading for me in so many ways since last year and it's the first time I've binged something like that too in such a long time like I have not wanted to sit there and just read through an entire series start to finish in so long until I started reading these. Please pick up Yona of the Dawn if you like manga even if you don't try it out I promise it's worth your time it's so fun it's such a good story. Okay after I binged all of my Yona of the Dawn volumes um um, I needed a bit of a break, so I took a break from reading, but then I decided to pick something up and reread an old favorite, and that is The Little Prince. This is probably actually what I would consider my favorite classic. It's not like a full novel, it's more like a short story type of thing, but I, I would definitely consider it like one of my favorite, if not my favorite classic of all time, because I love this book so much. It's meant so much to me since I was really young, and uh, my friend had never read it, so we decided to read it, and so I reread it again for the first time in a few years, and I still love it just as much as I did before. If you have not read The Little Prince yet, 
I absolutely recommend that you do. It's a fantastic story. It is so heartfelt and so emotional. I know it looks like it's for kids. I promise it's not just for kids. And even if it was, it would still be absolutely worth it. So many children's stories are still so impactful as you grow older. And this is one that withstands the test of time, absolutely. So many important, beautiful messages that are just woven throughout the story. I love it. This also reignited my need to reread so many things, which I think will be a trend in the next quarter of my reading. Okay, and then lastly, the final book that I I read so far this year is Daughter of the Moon Goddess. This is the first book in a fantasy duology that is inspired by a Chinese folk tale of the moon goddess, but I picked this up honestly because I love this cover so much and I've been seeing it everywhere and I was just hoping that the book would be as good as the cover is and honestly I can say that it is. It's so good. It's so fun. I've loved reading these. I'm on the second book right now. I still have like maybe 150 pages or so left, but yeah, I've just been really loving this series. It's really fun. It definitely has flaws. I will say right off the bat, it is too repetitive for sure. I think that the main character of this story is probably the most indecisive main character I've ever read about in my entire life. Girl is absolutely a Libra. I don't care what anyone says. She's a Libra. She can't make a decision to save her life and she just goes back and forth constantly. And it's also a love triangle. So she's constantly constantly just trying to choose between these two guys and she cannot make up her mind to the point where it will literally drive you insane. Like I said, I definitely do think that there are certain parts of it that could be condensed down a little bit too many times where I feel like the same thing is basically being repeated and said over and over again. But if we took those parts of the story out, the rest of it is so fantastical. It's really magical and it just has such good energy and it's just kept me reading and that's the other thing I really appreciate about it. I have not wanted to put these books down. I read this two days ago and I started the second one immediately afterwards and I've just been reading them back to back because I was just so engrossed in the world and the story and the characters. Also, specifically, this is really random reference and comparison. If you've watched the K-drama Alchemy of Souls, there are a lot of elements of like the relationships between the characters that I think is really similar to the show Alchemy of Souls. So if you really liked Alchemy of Souls, I think you will really like this as well. I just noticed that as I was reading it because I was like, it reminds me, like their relationship dynamics remind me of the relationship dynamics in that show. And I really like that show. So yeah, I've been having a great time with this series. I'm really glad I picked these up. So if you're looking for a new fantasy duology to start, I would recommend trying this out. But just know you will be fed up with the love triangle. But there you all have it. That is it for all of the books that I have read so far this year. I'm so happy that I've been able to read so much this year and that I've wanted to read so much this year. And I'm so looking forward to everything else that I'm going to be reading this year because I have a lot of plans, like specific books I'm planning to read and who knows what else I'll pick up because I'm so moody. So hopefully I end up reading a lot more five-star books because so far it's really only been a couple and I'm hoping to find those real standouts and those new all-time favorites. Let me know in the comments down below if you've read any of the books that I mentioned in this video and what your thoughts were on them. And also let me know what's the best book you've read so far this year. If you'd like to follow me on any of my social media, all my links are in the description box as always. But thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed and I will see you in my next video. Bye!